Okay, so welcome back to what is effectively the second presentation on the Kimu side of things. Last time, uh, we spent some time introducing why we were doing emulation of CXL in Kimu. This time, we're going to jump straight over that bit uh, and move on to kind of a bunch of stuff on what's new. So Fan is going to be co-presenting uh, on the basis that he's done a lot of work on the DCD emulation. So he's going to handle that part when we get onto it. But first of all, yeah, a quick agenda. So we're going to talk a little bit about what landed since last year, uh, some stuff on major topics uh, in flight. And the key bit is discussion over what's next. As I say here, jump in at any point uh, with questions. Um, just feel free to stick your hand up or stand up and you'll get hit on the head by a thrown mic, um, and hopefully can uh, yeah, raise your question. Um, I put a, a proviso at the bottom here. No, uh, we're only going to talk about stuff in published specifications. Um, I'm usually the militant one on this, so I may just say, nope, can't talk about that. Um, the very nature of CXL is it's moving fairly quickly, and there's lots of new and exciting stuff coming. So, some very small text. Um, Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, yeah, so before LPC last year, we did sort of basic enablement. Uh, since then, a number of things have landed upstream in the last year. So thanks to those various people who worked on these. I'm not going to call out names because I always forget people. Um, so we've got volatile support, multiple HDM decoders, CDAT, RAS error injection, poison injection, all that stuff. Um, under review, various other things like dynamic capacity devices. The things with stars, hopefully you can see the stars. Um, are the things that we're going to go into in a little bit more depth. So save your questions on those for now. Uh, yep, things like CCI, uh, reworking to support fabric management. That's been a big topic of I've been working on recently. Uh, scanning media stuff. We have a bunch of things uh, sat in the staging tree that we operate for Kimu that have not gone upstream for various reasons. I'm quite happy to talk about those. Uh, let's address that a little bit later. And we have a few other things that have been posted for discussion uh, on the mailing list, but no real intent yet uh, to upstream them. And in fact, the next talk is going to involve some type two stuff from Ira. I don't know if he's talking about the Kimu bit, but hopefully. So, handing over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fanny. I'm from Samsung. Today, I give a brief update about the dynamic capacity device emulation in Cumu. So I'll start with a brief recap about the dynamic capacity device. So before the introduction of a dynamic capacity device, if we want to add or release some memory capacities for CX memory, actually it can be very disruptive because the holes need to be reprogrammed to cover the range of the device change. And also, like all outstanding traffic to the device need to be quiet. And also, some most of the time, the system reset is required. So with DCD devices, it's much easier and convenient to do like allocation or deallocation memory capacities without the need to reprogram the HDM decoders. So the basic idea is that present the uh, maximum capacity of the device to the host, and then the host can program the whole the HDM decoders to cover the whole DPA range. And the, the device provides a set of commands to control the real like, allocation and the deallocation of the ranges that can be accessed by the host. So this is uh, the basic like, uh, unit for allocation and the deallocation. It's uh, called the dynamic capacity extends. Basically, it's a continuous range of blocks. So what we have now for dynamic capacity device emulation in Cumu. So currently, it's quite simple. We augmenting the types of memory devices with dynamic capacity. So before that, we have like a volatile and non-volatile uh, static uh, capacity for type three devices. Now we had a third one called a dynamic capacity. It's backed with uh, one to eight configurable dynamic capacity regions. And also in the device, we maintain a extend list representing the DPA ranges that can be used by the host. 
And also we support the basic read-write access to the dynamic region and also provide some mechanism to validation the, to make sure actually the uh, address range is backed by valid NAC like, extents. So to control and use the device, we also implement some mailbox command. Like for example, we can use like the get dynamic capacitive configuration command uh, from the host to retrieve all the dynamic capacity region information, like uh, start address of the region, the length of the region, and so on. And uh, the host can also use like a get dynamic capacity extend list to retrieve all the DPA ranges that it can use at this moment. This since this extended list is like uh, can dynamically change when we add more extends or remove some extends from the host. So whenever we want to get the latest the DPI ranges we want to access, we can use this command to do that. And uh, the add dynamic capacity response command is used to respond to a dynamic capacity add event in the event log. So whenever we see uh, dynamic capacity add event in the event log and the host can, after the host, like, uh, process the event and you can send the add dynamic capacity response to the device to show in like whether it will accept the uh, the extent or just reject it. And uh, whenever the host want to release the dynamic capacity extent, it will send uh, this uh, release dynamic capacity command. This can be a response to the dynamic capacity release like event in the event log or just because the host don't want to use the extent anymore. So based on the specification, like the FM is the main component to issue the add the dynamic capacity extent or release like a dynamic extent. But uh, at this moment, we don't have a fabric manager uh, in QMU, so we use like a QMP interface to simulate it so we can use this interface to send like a dynamic capacity add or release command to the and then uh, to the device and the, the device will add the extents in the event log the host can retrieve from there and process accordingly. So uh, uh, with the uh, functionalities mentioned above, we can uh, make some very simple tests and uh, also support the kernel side code development for dynamic capacity support. But uh, we are still missing something important. I think that's really something that makes dynamic capacity very like, uh, meaningful and uh, useful. For example, the, uh, currently we only add dynamic capacity to the simple like type three mem, mem device, but for more complicated devices like uh, multi-headed devices, uh, and the FAM or GFD, this device is, is supposed to be the main like uh, scenarios will use dynamic capacity device, but we don't have support yet. And also uh, for the these regions, currently we hard coded as long volatile, but this is easy to fix in the future if we want to support like volatile regions as well. And also at this moment, like uh, we do not support like uh, shared extends. That means each extend is only used by one host. So any like uh, tag related to sharing actually is there, but it's not used or tested at all. And also the uh, extend list, the generation number is there, but it's not used. Uh, that, that one should be easy to fix later if we have the need there. And uh, also like uh, all the add or release capacity actually is based on the extend list. So low tag based like operations there. For example, for the release command, actually based on the specification, we can release based on the tag, but currently we don't have that support in there since tag is not used actively now. And also all the like dynamic management uh, ma uh, command set from the FM side is not there because FM is not there. So uh, 
Uh, we already uh, we also noticed some like issues about the current CXL like spec three dot zero for dynamic capacity support. For example, the first issue we have noticed actually is that uh, the spec mentioned that FM is the main component to initialize to add multiple like extend in one request. Uh, from the define uh, definition of the request payload, we see like there is a extend list there. But the, the text also mentioned that each request actually may at most result in one record in the event log. But based on the dynamic capacity event record, there is, it can hold only one, like, uh, one extent there. So, there is, so if you, we want to like, add or release multiple extent in one request, actually, we cannot do it in one, like, uh, by inserting one record in the event log. So that's something supposed to be like fixed in future versions of the specification. Another thing, a uh, sim uh, similar thing here is that uh, when when the host like responds to a dynamic capacity add event, the text also mentioned that the host will send exactly one like uh, response there, but the uh, but the response payload also include a extend list. So if it's like a, a response to one record, so that means the extend list can hold at most one record there, like a, just a, a one extent or low extent at all. So, uh, this is based on current 3.0 like a specification. And uh, so, so this subset like means like uh, mentioned in the text, like uh, extends accepted by the host can be a subset of what have been offered by the, uh, by the device actually can only be zero or one. So, so this is something that could need to be fixed in future specifications. There are some other things, but I haven't mentioned in this talk yet. Okay, that's all for. Can you force release from QM, uh, QMU, like the QMP interface? Or do you have uh, that support yet? Uh, that command is uh, it's not added yet, but it should be easy because like you only need to change the event uh, type. Okay. Yeah. And then Ira is covering DCD on the kernel side, right? Okay. I'll yeah. Save save that for later. I I is this I had a, a general question. What was the motivation for for non volatile support by default? Like, uh, I think that's just because like. <laughs> Even for the static uh, capacity, we first support uh, like a long volatile, and uh, then on the kernel side, like uh, when we uh, when we process like a long volatile, volatile, volatile seems to be more complicated because it needs auto like discovery, right? Then, so I, I when I implement it, actually, I just want to make it. Uh, Simple and uh, usable can be tested easily, but uh, there's n there's not saying like we cannot support like a time. Yeah. yeah. I, did the did the patch from Gregory ever go up for volatile support? No. Did, did the patch the uh, because there should be nothing, nothing fundamentally different about supporting volatile versus non-volatile. I think this, this is the, the ghost of PMEM is why it's the QMU support started with non-volatile, but there's nothing. Yeah. Um, I, the reality is, is it doesn't make any difference. I had to pick one value for the flag. Yeah. Um, the volatile yeah. support would have been landing roughly in parallel with your work. Yeah. So while it is upstream, that, that was my, my yeah, it, it probably wasn't when you started. Okay. So, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There'll be plenty of time for more questions about DCD at the end. Hopefully. How are we doing? Okay. Next up, uh, there's a lot of material in this bit, so feel free to ask questions uh, and dive a little bit deeper. But the question, topic here is fabric management. So debated for a while whether it made sense to emulate this in Kimu, um, because it isn't something that is directly visible to the host. But things like dynamic capacity are very strong justifications for why we do need at least some of the fabric management, as Fanny mentioned a moment ago. 
Um, I, I, I snuck a star in on his slides when he said there wasn't any FM support because there is one command um, in one of the staging trees. It's completely useless, but it was just showing how it would work. You can add capacity, but you can't remove it. Um, so it's the same reason for emulation, basically, as we had for doing the Kimi emulation in the first place, which is as a test bench uh, for, in this case, fabric managers, uh, providing us something where we can tweak things, get an idea of how it all fits together. Um, we are very much in the early stages for open source fabric managers. Um, to some test code. I'm not sure if there's anything yet out there uh, corresponding to a full stack. But if anyone does have one and wants to talk about it, let me know, because um, I'd love to know what to test with. Um, the other classic here is CXL standards prove out. Um, I think the, the exercise of doing the original Kimi emulation and indeed all of the kernel work is showing that not everything can be considered in a spec that runs quite so far ahead of where hardware is. So it's very useful from that side of things. Um, another key thing here is if we are driving some of these complex devices, so some of the switches and the configurability of those, uh, or indeed dynamic capacity, it's really handy to have a standard interface to poke it with. Um, and adding the fabric management gives us that option. And we'll come on to exactly how that comes together. I have added a note here that we're not talking about CXL3 fabrics in this case. This is the simpler version of fabric management where it all looks a bit like a PCI topology. So there'll be a lot of slides here with a lot of lines on them, uh, but hopefully I'll skip through what we're covering. So there are all sorts of different communication channels. Hey, Dan. Well, so, so, uh, so uh, kind of the fundamental question, and it's good to ask, I think, in, in, in this kind of context is, like, we upstreamed the QME support for CXL because we need like pre-hardware, but we had a production use case for the kernel code uh, yep. the, and the devices are coming. Uh, my, my, you might see my comments on the switch CCI stuff. Like we don't do, do we, or like the, the, the upstream consumer for switch CCI and the kernel side is not as clear to me. Like what are we building? Like basically I'm not, I'm not super confident about just landing kernel code just, just for, just for testing. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, the key thing is the blob on the left here is I agree it's not a normal host kernel. I think we will see BMCs making use of this in the same sense that they may use of some of the MCTP stack that so, frankly the kernel supports and doesn't get used from Linux. So, so should I be reviewing these patches in the context of uh, when somebody else from a BMC land comes along and says, hey, we want to build fabric manager interfaces like this is the ABI that we, yes. that we are recommending for you to use? Well, I think the last thing we want to do is to end up with a Linux kernel running on a BMC stack that bears no resemblance to the main kernel stack where there are shared components. And um, particularly for the switch CCI, we've also got the PCI mailbox thing, which is MMPT, uh, which is kicking around, which is going to see some use from host because it's much more heavily used for things like firmware update. Um, Who is going to work on the blob of the BMC part, right? Like, So I see the pieces there for the switch CCI, but I think it would make it very clear for people if you're like, Okay, this is exposing it over TCP to another host, right? And then you talk to the FM. Like, so the pieces are there, right? Like, it's it's almost yeah. there, but it's not real, right? And so, so we the, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of diagrams drawn on the many many forms of Fabric Manager yeah. that you can evolve. And to be fair, this one is focusing on the very simplest, yeah. which is simply a memory appliance with, and in this case, the BMC is just the controller of that memory appliance. So commands coming into that will come over something else. They won't be over um, FM API. They'll be Redfish or one of the DMTF standards. So, Some of that stuff still being defined. So it's still weird with QMU because like the current switch is owned by a host, single host, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no real mechanism to discover um, ports that are coming from somewhere else, right? Like yep. it doesn't make complete sense, right? Like from a QMU mm -hmm. perspective, right? What do you think about that? Agreed. I, you're absolutely right. There have been discussions on how to broaden to multi-host okay. QMU for precisely that reason, so that okay. you'll be able to run a number of hosts. Who's, uh, who's working on this? Is this in, in public domain that people are talking about this? There have been a few discussions in feedback on some of the patches about it. Okay. Um, and I've had a number of other people reach out and say, oh, can we do this slightly ah. crazy thing? Because they are very much interested in working on the large-scale fabric managers. And if you can poke some data through. Okay. Because there are, I mean, people have looked at emulating just that without the hosts involved as well. And the problem is you never prove your full use case. You prove a little emulator of just the fabric wiring. More thing, and I'll let you get on with it. So are these, are these switch CCIs going to be hidden? Like, it, it, imagine we have QMU, BMC running. BMC is going, 
are you expecting BMC is, is discovering these switch ECIs itself and they're invisible to the host? Or are, 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 yeah, in that we'll kind of environment? We'll get there. Okay. Um, Absolutely, the expectation. There's nothing in the Kimia configuration that says the switch CCI needs to be on the same topology as the host is. I mean, the reality we only have one topology at the moment, so it would just end up on a different root port. But you can certainly do that sort of configuration. Um, we'll, we'll come on to yeah a little bit more on combining the BMC and the host for testing purposes. Anyway, this slide is just meant to say there's some in-band stuff. That was kind of it. Um, and we will build up. Uh, another thing that's crucial for fabric management is MCTP over various transports. Um, there are a lot of them drawn on here. So you can see there's a whole bunch of wires going to effectively every component. Uh, this is looking at the outer band type signal in. So this would be something like I squared C, I3C, or I mean, it could be Ethernet, it could be any number of different things. MCTP is carried over almost anything. Um, this includes stuff like the multi headed device pool CCIs. Um, there are other paths to get to those, which we'll come back to. Um, yeah, basically you wire everything to everywhere. And so we need a path to emulate that. Uh, moving on to the next bit. Now you notice that there's no new stuff in the list of things we can do with this, but this is just introducing the fact that MCTP can also be carried over vendor defined messages on PCI, uh, which becomes relevant in the next slide. Yeah, feel free to look at these later. Um, there's a lot of lines. Okay, so the key thing here is that this ability to carry them over PCI VDM enables the tunneling concept. So you can go into, say, a switch, and then you can tunnel down through the downstream ports of that switch to the individual devices below it and configure all of them. Uh, you can also tunnel out from where you first hit, once you go the downstream device where you hit something that's owned by the fabric manager, you can tunnel out to the individual devices exposed to a host and <laughs> do things like set the label storage area. Uh, or pre-configure stuff. Um, you can actually send PCI writes and reads as well. Um, so you can configure anything. Um, yep. Right. I can't even read this slide. Well, yes, that's just saying what I said. Okay. Yes. So this is the question Dan was asking about, which is what, how are we emulating the switch CCI or indeed the rest of this stuff? Now, under normal circumstances, um, this would be a different host. That's not something that's easy to do in Kimu today. There are out of pre solutions for this. We're aware of a number of companies who have such solutions. If anyone wants to speak up, five minutes. Ah, I think you said you wanted to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Um, yeah, they, they do exist. So there are multi host Kimu setups that are useful for exactly this BMC uh, type emulation. Um, but for now, and also useful for testing purposes, uh, what we actually do is we sweep everything in the BMC round and push it on to the host. And in fact, we actually combine multiple hosts as well. This allows us to exercise all of the various paths of things going away, reappearing, all of the DCD flows, all of that stuff can then be poked from a single host, which makes testing a lot simpler, hopefully. Although, as I say, we only have one command at the moment for DCD. Okay. Oh. So skipping on, and I don't propose to talk about anything on this slide. This is here as a prompt list um, in case anyone doesn't have any questions. Um, but the aim at this point is to address what people are interested in seeing, what they're not seeing at the moment um, in the CXL emulation. So there's a question um, mm -hmm. on, on, online. Uh, Lee's asking, is there a plan to enable KVM and CXL emulation ah. with the, the node problem? Yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> As long as you don't like instructions. I mean, with, without instructions, it works perfectly. No, you can use it. You can use it. Da data's fine. Execute. OK, so the fundamental problem here is that for CXL, the granularity of interleave, which we've emulated for a long time, is much finer than page level. Now, in order to do any of the stuff that's done with KVM, et cetera, you tend to do it in page tables. So at best, you've got 4K. Um, combining the two is, is a bit of a problem. Uh, actually, even in TCG, we had a problem for a while because it didn't handle x86 instructions that went across a page boundary. Um, but the reality is the way we're handling it at the moment is every single read or write has to go through the ultimate slow path in TCG, which means there's no caching of instruction translations, any of that stuff. Um, so it's very slow. 
And also with KVM, in order to make that work, you would have to add emulation of pretty much every instruction to the kernel. And that's just not going to fly. Now, we have had discussions about how to do this. We can put caching layers in between. But the fundamental question is, do we actually care? As a general rule, the KIMU emulation is not there for performance cases. Um, we do have a problem at the moment, which is that it's so bad that it tends to stall completely um, if you're running any in, um, programs out of this memory, which does make certain types of testing a little challenging. Um, it leads to some not helpful bug reports uh, along the lines of it don't work, um, which we're fully aware of. So it, it's absolutely something that we can look to address, but it's a big and complex bit of work. And it's not clear if it's worth doing. Um, yeah, I stuck it down here as performance optimization, but yeah, I guess KVM is a really big performance optimization. So it was a good question. Uh, any other questions at this point? Or oh, jump on anything on there. Oh, we've got someone at the back. Throw him a mic. Uh, it says ARM support. Could you use some help at the bottom? Can you go into a little detail on that for me? Oh, yes. Excellent. Thank you. So one of the things on the ARM support is we're trying to add it to ARMvert in Kimi. Now, the problem with ARMvert is it has a fairly strong rule that it must have device tree support. Uh, there are one or two things that have slipped through when maintainer didn't notice. So one of those is the PXB stuff, the PCI expander bridges. Now, those are used by, well, they're used for a bunch of reasons around new topologies and things normally. Uh, but the CXL device is a descendant of one of those. And the problem with those is they have an enumeration problem, uh, which is that they're actually enumerated by EDK2. And if you're in, so you, you go through a double firmware build thing. So you build enough information to pass to the BIOS. The BIOS then enumerates the entire PCI topology and fills in the gaps for all the PXPs. And then you go back into Kimi, which rebuilds all the tables mm -hmm. before um, providing them to the, the distro or whatever's running on top. In device tree, there's no such path. Um, so the discussion there is, what on earth can we do about enumerating these? We could enumerate them in the kernel, but is the kernel going to take a bunch of nasty support for what is basically a Kimu hack? Um, we could do static enumeration. I gave a talk at Lenora Connect on this earlier in the year um, and got some good feedback for the maintainers there, but we haven't solved it. I mean, I feel like the idea that an QEMU is going to need to get arbitrary device trees passed into it. Like if you're running a, if you're running an ARM kernel under QEMU, mm -hmm. intrinsically you have to describe the whole platform you're running on. So yes. to so, so to me, the idea that <laughs> I say, you got to throw it back. <laughs> We're done. Just make him walk. We're done. Out of time. Ah. Anyway, carry on laughless. I talked for that one for many hours. I hope I.